Theodor Eicke, born on 17th of October 1892 in Hampont, renamed Houdingen in 1915 near Chateau Salin, had a humble beginning as the youngest of 11 children in a lower middle class family. His father, known for his staunch German patriotism, worked as a station master. Despite his familial background, Eike struggled academically and eventually dropped out of school at the age of 17, foregoing his graduation. Choosing a different path, Eike enlisted in the Bavarian Army, initially serving with the 23rd Bavarian Infantry Regiment at Landau before being transferred to the Bavarian 3rd Infantry Regiment in 1913. With the outbreak of World War I in 1914, Eike found himself thrust into the Lorraine Campaign, participating in pivotal battles such as the First and Second Battles of Ypres and the Battle of Verdun while serving with the 2nd Bavarian Foot Artillery Regiment. Despite initially serving as a clerk and assistant paymaster, Eike's bravery on the front lines earned him the Iron Cross Second Class, although he spent much of the war behind the lines due to his role as a regimental paymaster. In late 1914, Eike obtained permission from his commanding officer to take a temporary leave to marry Bertha Schwebel of Ilmenau on 26 December 1914. Their union resulted in two children, a daughter named Irma, born on 5th April 1916, and a son named Hermann, born on 4th May 1920. Following the conclusion of World War I, Eike continued his military service as a paymaster for the Reichswehr of the Weimar Republic until his resignation in 1919. He then attempted to pursue further education at a technical school in Ilmenau, but was forced to abandon his studies due to financial constraints. Eike subsequently embarked on a career in law enforcement, initially working as an informant and later as a regular policeman in various departments. However, his tenure in law enforcement was short-lived as his vocal disdain for the Weimar Republic and his involvement in violent political demonstrations led to his dismissal in 1923. In the same year, Eike found employment at IG Farben in Ludwigshafen, where he served as a security officer until 1932. These early experiences in the military, law enforcement and industry would shape Eike's future endeavors and ideological convictions, laying the groundwork for his infamous role in the SS during the tumultuous years that followed. Nazi activism, early SS membership, and exile. Theodor Eike's journey into the folds of Nazism commenced with a resonance that mirrored his disillusionment with the Weimar Republic. On December 1, 1928, he officially became a member of the Nazi Party, joining as number 114901, and concurrently enlisted in the Sturmabteilung, SA, Ernst Röhm's paramilitary force. However, by August 1930, Eike transitioned his allegiance to the Schutzstaffel, SS, becoming member number 2,921. His ascent within the SS ranks was rapid, attributed to his adeptness in recruitment and organization building, particularly in the Bavarian Palatinate region. Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsfuhrer of the SS, recognized Eike's prowess and elevated him to the rank of SS Standartenführer, colonel equivalent in 1931. However, Eike's burgeoning political activities didn't go unnoticed by his employer, IG Farben, leading to his dismissal in early 1932. Simultaneously, his involvement in planning bomb attacks against political adversaries in Bavaria resulted in a two-year prison sentence. Yet, through the intervention of Bavarian Minister of Justice Franz Gertner, an ardent Nazi sympathizer, Eike eluded incarceration and sought refuge in Italy under Heinrich Himmler's directives. Italy, already under fascist rule under Benito Mussolini, served as a fitting backdrop for Eike's endeavors. Entrusted with overseeing a terrorist training camp for Austrian Nazis at Lake Garda, Eike even had the privilege of acquainting Mussolini with his operations. His return to Germany in March 1933, shortly after Hitler's ascension to power, marked a tumultuous period for Eike. Engaging in political disputes with Gauleiter Joseph Berkel led to his arrest and confinement in a mental asylum in Würzburg. Stripped of his SS membership and rank by Himmler due to alleged breaches of trust, 
Ica found himself ensnared in a precarious situation. However, a declaration of his mental soundness by the asylum's director prompted Himmler to reinstate Ica into the SS fold, promoting him to SS Oberführer, senior colonel equivalent. Subsequently, on June 26, 1933, Ike assumed the role of commandant at the Dachau concentration camp, succeeding SS Sturmbannführer Hilmar Weckerl following investigations into detainee murders. Ike's tenure at Dachau heralded significant reforms in the concentration camp system. Promoted to SS Brigadeführer, Brigadier General Equivalent, on January 30, 1934, he undertook a comprehensive overhaul of Dachau's operations, instituting stringent disciplinary measures and uniform regulations for both guards and prisoners. His introduction of the iconic blue and white striped pajamas and the death's head insignia on guard uniforms would come to epitomize the Nazi concentration camp system across Europe. Despite his reforms, Eicher's draconian methods an unwavering loyalty to Hitler and the SS underscored his ruthless persona, earning him the moniker of the Inspector of Concentration Camps by May 1934. Eicher's ascendancy within the SS culminated during the Night of the Long Knives in 1934. Tasked with assisting in the elimination of Ernst Röhm and other SA leaders, Eicher played a pivotal role in the purging of potential threats to Hitler's regime. Following the purge, Himmler officially appointed Eicher as Chief of the Inspection der Konzentrationslager, Concentration Camps Inspectorate, solidifying his authority over the SS-run camps. Consequently, Dachau became the training ground for the SS's concentration camp service, reflecting Eicher's instrumental role in shaping the regime's oppressive apparatus. As the head of the Concentration Camps Inspectorate, Ike orchestrated further reorganizations within the camp system, solidifying the SS's control and introducing forced labor as a means of maximizing its efficacy. Despite opposition from figures like Reinhard Heydrich, Ike's influence prevailed, expanding the death's head troops and establishing new, larger camps across Germany and its annexed territories. His role as the architect of the SS-run camp system cemented his position as one of the regime's most feared and influential figures, epitomizing the brutality and inhumanity of the Nazi regime. As World War II erupted in 1939, the notable achievements of various SS formations prompted the expansion of the Waffen-SS. By October 1939, the success of units like the SS Infanterie Regiment MOT, Leibstandarte, SS Adolf Hitler, and the three Standarten of the SS Verfügungstruppe, SSVT, led to the establishment of three additional Waffen SS divisions. Among these developments, Theodor Eike was entrusted with the command of a newly formed division known as the SS Division Totenkopf. Comprising elements from the first, Oberbayern, second, Brandenburg, and 3rd Thüringen, Standarten of the SS Totenkopfverbände, alongside soldiers from the SS Heimwehr Danzig. The SS Division Totenkopf emerged from the ranks of concentration camp guards. With Ike transitioning to combat duties, his deputy Richard Glucks assumed leadership of the concentration camp's inspectorate, CCI, under Himmler's directives. By 1940, administrative oversight of the CCI fell under the purview of the SS Hauptamt Verwaltung und Wirtschaft, SS Office for Administration and Business, overseen by Oswald Pohl. Subsequently, in 1942, the CCI evolved into Amt D within the consolidated SS Wirtschaftsverwaltungshauptamt, SS Economic and Administrative Department, still under Pohl's command. This restructuring positioned the entire concentration camp system under the authority of the WVHA, with the inspector of concentration camps now answering to the chief of the WVHA. Despite these changes, Pohl assured Ica that the command structure he had implemented would remain insulated from the influence of the Gestapo or SD. However, the CCI and later AMT-D operated under the jurisdiction of the SD and Gestapo, 
concerning admittance and release of prisoners, while internal camp affairs fell under the purview of Amt D. The SS Division Totenkopf, subsequently known as the Totenkopf Division, emerged as a formidable force on the Eastern Front. It distinguished itself during pivotal campaigns, such as the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, the Summer Offensive in 1942, the capture of Kharkov, operations within the Demyansk Pocket, the Vistula Oder Offensive, and the Battle of Budapest in 1945. However, the division's effectiveness was tainted by allegations of brutality and war crimes, including the infamous massacre of 97 British prisoners of war in Le Paradis, France, in 1940, during their service on the Western Front. Additionally, the division gained notoriety for the widespread execution of captured Soviet soldiers and the systematic pillaging of Soviet villages throughout the conflict. On February 26, 1943, Theodore Ike met his end during the initial phases of the Third Battle of Kharkov. While piloting his Fieseler Fee 156 Storch reconnaissance aircraft, Ike's plane was downed by Red Army anti-aircraft artillery between the villages of Artilin and Mikolaivka, approximately 105 kilometers, 65 mikres, south of Kharkov, near Lozova. In the aftermath of his death, Iku was eulogized as a hero in Axis propaganda. Shortly thereafter, one of the infantry regiments of the Totenkopf division was bestowed with the Kuf titler Theodor Iki in his honor. Initially laid to rest at a German military cemetery near the village of Odikne, Odikne in the Kharkiv Oblast, Ukraine, Iki's remains were later relocated by Himmler to a cemetery in Hegewald, situated south of Zhytomyr in Ukraine. However, as the tide turned against the German forces and the Red Army launched counterattacks, Ike's final resting place faced desecration. It is believed that his grave, like many others, fell victim to the bulldozing efforts of Soviet forces who customarily obliterated German burial sites. Thus, the exact whereabouts of Ike's remains remain unknown, lost to the ravages of war and the passage of time. Thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and share it. Your support is greatly appreciated, and you can find details on how to support my channels through PayPal in the description box below.